There's one thing in particular on Model A's, and really all early Fords for that matter, that I think it's a bad rap. There's a lot of false information, wives' tales, and horror stories floating around about mechanical brakes. Most of that comes from the fact that people just don't understand them. They don't know how they work, they don't know how to service them, and they don't know how to adjust them properly. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Ford used mechanical brakes on their vehicles up through 1938 which was long after most other car manufacturers switched over to hydraulic. Uh, Ford finally switched over in 1939, although the system they went to, in my opinion, was just as bad, if not worse, than the mechanical system. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later in the video. I'll do some comparisons with the mechanical and the early Lockheed-style hydraulic brakes and why I don't think they're that great of an option. I have this 1930 chassis sitting behind me here, and I figured having this here with all the brake components still on it and no body on it, would be a great time to do a video on how this system works, all the different components, and you can really get a good view as to how everything is laid out without the body in the way. So we're going to start right here at the pedal assembly. Now on Model A's, the pedals were actually attached to the bell housing. There's a shaft that comes out of the side of the bell housing here. The pedals ride on that. Now there's a lever coming off of your brake pedal here, obviously, with this rod that goes back. Uh, Henry Ford had this saying, it was uh, the feel of steel from the pedal to the wheel or solid steel from the pedal to the wheel or something like that. He didn't trust early hydraulic brakes. That's why I guess he stuck with these so long that he's a giant cheap ass and stubborn. So the combination of all of those is why Ford stuck with mechanical brakes this long. So again, this was a Model A only thing that attached to the bell housing. In 1932, they actually went to a separate pedal assembly. And all the way up to the end, they had a separate pedal assembly. So 1932, the mounting bracket would have been flat and it would have gone against the K member, which sat in here. And 33 through, uh, well, 33 on up, actually, um, they had an X member. So instead of just this cross member like this, there was actually an X member in here. And the pedal had a slanted mount and it mounted to the side of that. Uh, they changed a little bit every couple of years, but for the most part, that was how they worked. So with this, you've got your pedal here and your initial rod. This runs back to your service shaft, which is right here. This shaft runs one side to the other. There are bushings in here that need to be serviced and greased. So when you step on that pedal, it pulls that and twists that shaft. Obviously, it doesn't move a whole lot. Now on the ends of those shafts, you have these arms where your brake rods attach. So we're over on the other side now because these are actually hooked up. So as you can see, obviously when you step on the brake and it rotates this shaft, it's going to pull on this rear rod and pull on this front rod in this direction. So now looking at it from the front, this is that brake rod that came off the center service shaft. It ties into this arm on the actuator. So as you push on the pedal, it pulls on that rod, which pulls this back. There's a shaft that runs inside of here and into the top of your kingpin. These are interesting kingpins because they have this dome on the top where your actuator sits into. They use this style of kingpin right up through 1936. However, they were different. Um, Model A's are one way. 32 to 34 are different because the face of this has a slight angle to it. And then 35 and 36 are also different from the rest of them. I believe it's a smaller dome on that. So inside here is where that pin runs, and we'll look at that a little bit later in the different styles of that. Now we're in the back. This is the driver's side rear, and you can see it has two arms in here. Uh, one is actually the parking brake, emergency brake, whatever you want to call it, and the other is your normal service brake. So Model A's were the only one that had separate brakes. Starting in 32, they actually tied them in together, so your parking brake just actuated your normal service brake. So that's kind of a nice thing with Model A's, you actually have a backup system if, say, this clevis broke or your pedal broke or something, you've got the emergency brake lever, which gives you an auxiliary braking system. So that's one advantage to the Model A setup. So here's the emergency brake lever, and you have the rod that runs back to the emergency brake shaft, similar to how your service brake shaft is set up. But again, these are the only ones that had a whole separate system. So this is your emergency brake shaft, and it works the same way where the shaft rotates and pulls on that arm. Again, in 32, they went to a system 
where your emergency brake lever just actuated your normal braking system. We're back up front here. Now, the adjustment on these, and this was the same right up through 1936. The adjustment bolt is up on the top here. This is how you adjust your shoes against the drums. In 1937, this system changed over to a cable operated system. So everything is different on 1937 and 1938. The cable system, I don't think is a very good setup. Uh, some people still run them. The cables tend to stretch. These rods obviously don't stretch, or very little if they do. Um, the cables tend to stretch, and they require a lot more adjustment. Um, so while we're on the topic of adjustment, let's look at what it is that you actually have to adjust on these. So beyond the normal service thing, um, if you have a Model A manual, it tells you all the things to service. Like these pins need to be oiled. All the grease fittings need to be greased. Um, this is a fair amount of maintenance and service that goes along with them. But when it comes time to actually adjust them, the first thing you do is take the slack out of this rod. So you loosen this nut, unhook this pin, and pull this actuator back until it's tight against the pin to where it's not applying the brakes, but where it would be if you moved it anymore. You pull this rod forward and you get the holes to line up. And if they don't line up, you need to adjust this clevis in or out to match that. And do that on all four corners. And at that point, you're ready to adjust the brakes themselves. And that's where this comes in. And there's a whole procedure for where your brake pedal should be and the amount of braking force on each wheel and all that stuff. But I won't bother going into that. You can buy a service manual and that tells you really well how to do that. Uh, but this is how you adjust it. And the unfortunate thing with these is that they're, they're not an infinite adjustment. They're a click. So what I run into most of the time is that the ideal spot is in between clicks. So you go too far and it's too tight. You back up a click and it's too loose. And there's no real good happy medium most of the time. Uh, that's why I like the, the Flathead Ted's floater kit, which I'll show a little bit later, uh, because they don't have the click set up in them. That's just an infinitely adjustable one. And there's a jam nut that holds it in place. Another thing worth noting that's different is in 32, they actually did away with this entire cross shaft and it had a center mounted uh, actuation system so your rods come in at angles from the wheels and mount into the center here and the same thing with the back and they use that same system on uh, 32 up through 36. Now when it comes to adjustment you can buy this wrench that's made specifically for brake adjustment it has the square hole in it obviously you could use a regular open end wrench if you wanted to uh, these are a little better for not rounding that off though. So now we're going to look at some areas that need to be maintained and serviced. Uh, you want to make sure the system is in good shape if you're going to use this because having play and slop and lack of lubrication in a lot of the areas can cause the system to have some issues. So first off, starting at the pedals, there are bushings in these pedals. You can kind of tell by moving these back and forth. See these have a little bit of play, that's really not too bad. But you can replace those bushings and if that shaft is worn, you can replace the shaft as well. But you want to lubricate that shaft. You want to lubricate all of these pins with a couple drops of oil just to keep everything moving freely. Underneath here, again, on your service shaft, there are brass bushings in the frame mount here. You wanna make sure with the rods unhooked that this doesn't have a bunch of clay moving up and down, which as you can see this one does. So those need to be checked. Now on the back, you've got the same deal where you've got the pins that need to be lubricated. There's a grease fitting down in here as well for that, that arm on the inside. Up in the front, same deal, you wanna oil that pin you want to hit the grease fitting on this actuator arm and when you have it apart obviously you can't really get to it now but when it's apart you want to put some grease on the end of that that pin that rides inside this there's a uh, cup on the inside of this that rides on the top of that pin which is rounded off so at this point hopefully you've got a basic understanding as to how this system works and the different components of it the different areas that need to be serviced and uh, different areas that need to be repaired occasionally uh, so next we're going to take a look at the actual brake assemblies themselves show you the difference between the Model A up to the 32 to 34, 35 and 36, and then early hydraulic systems too, which were called the Lockheed system. Those early Lockheed systems are really popular for traditional hot rod builds just because that's what they would have used back in the 40s. They don't work all that well, I don't think. Um, they're period correct. They look the part absolutely. In my opinion, if you have a good functioning, complete mechanical brake system like what's on this car, it just needs a couple things, a couple bushings and some maintenance. I would just leave this alone and run this. There are some drawbacks to it and we'll go into that in a little bit as far as the drums go, uh, but you can upgrade to a later style 
32 and up brakes, which are a huge improvement over the, the front brakes on these. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit. Well, it only makes sense to go in order. So we'll start off by looking at the Model A brakes. Um, they ran these obviously from 28 to 31 or technically 27 to 32 if you're an internet know-it-all. But yes, Model A. So let's take a look at uh, the operation of these. So these are fixed top and bottom. There's no movement really to the shoes other than the adjustment up here and the actuation down here. So up in the top, you've got an adjustment screw if you've ever adjusted these. You've got uh, that uh, square head on the back that you turn. And this is the adjuster. And every time it clicks, that's what those little teeth are. So that pushes the top of the shoes out against the drum to give you your adjustment. Uh, when you actuate the brakes, there's this pin. It's the operating pin that runs down through the kingpin. It sets into the top of this wedge. And you pushing on the brake pedal actuates that, pushes this wedge down, and spreads these shoes out. And that's how you get contact with the shoe and the drum. Seeing as how the shoes are fixed, you have to center them in the drum, obviously, because they can't adjust themselves like more modern brakes can. So they're kind of a pain in the ass to set up. Uh, they, they, the tracks behind here will wear, the rollers will wear and stuff. It's just, it's not a real great setup, but they work and they're rebuildable and most of the parts are available, which is the nice thing about those. Uh, so that's your basic Model A setup. The drums are a big difference on these and one of the main upgrades or main advantages, I think, to going from Model A to 32 to 34 brakes. This is a 32 to 34 drum. Obviously, like I said, it's a little larger, but the other thing is it's cast iron. Model A drums are steel. Why they ever made them out of steel, I have no idea, but they suck. They don't dissipate heat well at all, and you get pretty serious brake fade. They don't machine well. They're just a bad design. They do make cast iron replacements. If you're going to stick with the Model A brakes, that's definitely the way to go. Get rid of these and go with cast iron drums. If you have these and they're in decent shape, you can run them. They're not unsafe. I drove this car for a couple of years with those brakes on it and it works, but there's definitely better options. So I think that's a key thing to upgrading is to get rid of those steel drums and a little bit larger drums. So now I'm going to take a look at what I consider to be the best brakes out of all mechanicals, 35 to 36. These again are a 12 inch brake, but they are uh, 12 by inch and three quarters. So you get even more braking surface than the 32 to 34 brakes. Other upgrades on these are the bottom pin is now floating. So it allows these shoes to move back and forth. That helps a lot with not having to mess around with centering the shoe in the drum. It will do it itself. I have replaced the adjusters with a kit from company Flathead Ted's makes these adjuster kits where instead of this being all one piece, this is now separate from this. And that's what this wedge right here is. So this is actually what's in there now. Instead of that one piece one I just showed you, it's two pieces. So it allows this to move and it's actually positioned like this. And it allows the shoes to move back and forth. So now you have a floating upper pin and a floating lower pin and you get similar operation now to more modern brakes. Now another thing to note on these is that the operating pin, again, that runs down through the kingpin, is again different. It's the same length as the 32 to 34 since it's still a 12 inch brake, but it now has a cupped end on the wedge instead of a ball end. So here's the 1935 drum. As you can see, it's very similar to a 32 to 34 drum, but a way you can tell the difference real easy is a 35 drum has several ribs on it where the 32 to 34 drum does not. So that's a quick, easy way to tell. Now these are a one year only. 36 went to a wide five pattern. So it's Five lug on, uh, I think it's ten and a half inch instead of five on five and a half inch. Those were also one year only because 37 changed to a new style spindle. So now I want to talk about how to adapt different brake systems to different axles. This is a 31 Model A. I'm running a 32 to 36 axle, 32 perches, 32 spindles. Stock Model A brake actuators and stock Model A kingpins. And depending on what you have for an axle is going to determine what you need for a perch. You can run stock Model A axle just fine and stock perches and different brakes, and everything will work just fine. I wanted to lower the car a little bit, so we're running this axle with this setup. You can also run mechanical brakes on a four inch dropped axle. You need to run the same, it actually needs to be a stretch drop. When they do that, instead of just bending this web up, they stretch it and bend it up, so it maintains the same distance from here to here. That way you can still run mechanical brakes. If you're going to do that, you need to make an extension for where the 
brake actuator mounts into the perch. You'd bring it up, I think it's an inch to inch and a quarter because it's going to be, end up being up in here to maintain the, the angle of your actuator. So now if you're building a Model A, it's easiest to stick with all the Model A components since it's already all here. You get into the later cars, 32s had a different setup where the, the rods don't run in the same location and they changed it continuously up through the years. If you're running a Model A, stick with all the stock stuff, Model A actuators and Model A kingpins. 32 to 34 kingpins look very similar. However, the angle on the face here is slightly more than the Model A and they will not work with Model A actuators. So make sure you have the right kingpins. Regardless of what you're doing for a setup, let's say you want to run later brakes. Model A actuators and Model A kingpins. So now running later brakes on a Model A setup, the backing plates are the same bolt pattern right up through 36 so they will bolt right on no problem i did have to clearance the top of the kingpin it rubs on the backing plate you have to get in here and shave this down a little so it doesn't hit so now i did run into a couple issues with these brakes that i didn't realize ahead of time the first thing that came up is as i mentioned earlier the operating pins are different so you need to have the operating pins match whatever brake setup you're running. Um, I completely forgot about that and having to order a set of pins. Third Gen Auto, the great company to deal with. I've been buying a lot of stuff from them. They carry all that stuff, so go to them if you need any of this stuff. Second thing I ran into is the face of the spindle where the uh, bearing sits. Now, Model A's up through 34's used this little baffle type thing. It sits up on here and actually presses onto that. And there's no inner seal like you have on a modern car for the inner wheel bearing. This is just this. Well, starting in 35, they got rid of that and went to an actual pressed in seal right here. It goes into the drum like a more modern car. What I didn't realize is that the spindle is also different. If you look right here, this is a 35 spindle. You can see it has this shelf here where that seal rides. This does not. So now putting your inner bearing on, you've got this to stop it, and on here you don't. So when I first put this together, obviously the drum went on and ran into the backing plate. That wasn't going to work. So what we needed was something to space this out so that the bearing would be at the right location. Now there's kits available for converting Model A spindles to hydraulic brakes. Now the reason for that is that the, the snout is shorter on the 37 and up spindles. When you get this kit, it comes with these rings, which are for the backing plate because they have a different size hole in them. But it also comes with these spacers for the inner bearing to make up for the shorter nose. Um, I wasn't sure if it was going to work or not, so I just said to hell with it and ordered one. And this is that inner spacer. For whatever reason, it's the same distance. So if you're going to adapt 35 brakes to earlier spindles, this will actually work. And it just goes on like that, and your inner bearing goes in. And now you have your inner bearing in the right location and you have a sealing surface for your, your wheel seal. Now this right here is a 42 to 48, I believe. Uh, 39 was a very similar, except they had bolts down here instead of pins. Same basic operation, except there was another adjustment. The problem with these is they're very similar to the original Model A setup. Like I mentioned earlier, your shoes are fixed. So these are fixed right here. And the only action you have is this wheel cylinder pushing out on these. Uh, I guess before we go any further, I should go over a couple of terms that people seem to screw up all the time. You've got self-energizing and self-adjusting brakes. A lot of people don't seem to know what that means. Self-adjusting simply means that as you drive the car, they will adjust themselves. Pretty simple idea. Um, what you have to do is back up and come to a complete stop and reverse. And then when you go forward again, the movement of the shoes will cause them to adjust. Ford didn't do that until... I believe the mid-60s on up were all self-adjusted. Now, the other thing that's more important is self-energizing. These are not self-energizing. So self-energizing means that while the wheel cylinder does still push out on the shoes, the shoes also actuate themselves. So this is an F100 brake setup, and this is self-energizing compared to this. So this does not have fixed points on the shoes. These shoes are able to move around. So when you actuate the brakes with the wheel cylinder, it will push the shoes out into the drum. At the same time, the drum pushing back on it will push this shoe through the adjuster into this shoe, pushing this shoe harder into the drum. So now, as you can see, this earlier brake does not have that. These are fixed, therefore the only action you get is from that wheel cylinder. Now, the 1935 brakes, as I mentioned, are floating on the bottom, and with that adjustment kit on top, you now have a similar setup to this, where the shoes are allowed to move, and the force from one shoe can act upon the other shoe to to help enhance the braking. So here's another advantage to running later brakes is that with the F1 and F100 brakes, now there's a separate hub. 
so the drums are much easier to replace instead of having to cut the swedge off and put a new drum on like you would on the earlier ones. So if you are looking to upgrade to hydraulic brakes, which is not really the scope of this video, but just to throw this note in there, I would strongly suggest going with F1 or F100 brakes. Now the wheel bearings are different. Kit available through Speedway, or you can go on the ham and they'll give you part numbers as to what bearings and races to use for these on later spindles. I believe you can also adapt these to Model A spindles using that spacer and those other wheel bearings. So I think that's a much better option if you're going hydraulic is to go F1 or F100. The earlier ones obviously look the part. That's the traditional thing, but if you plan on driving the car and want it to stop well, uh, this is definitely a better option. And also, this doesn't have it, obviously. This is non-self-adjusting. But the self-adjusting setup out of later brakes, I think it was 64 or 5 and up, somewhere around there. You can buy that kit and it will install in F1 and F100 brakes. So then you can have self-adjusting and self-energizing brakes while still having old-school looking drum brakes. So personally, I think that's the way to go. Uh, they're not real easy to find, but uh, if you find people that are upgrading to disc brakes, you can certainly find used sets for decent prices. So hopefully you found this video helpful and give you a better understanding as to how mechanical brakes work and the differences and the, the changes throughout the years. Again, I like this setup, and me personally, if, you, if you're building a hot rod, or doing a restoration. Uh, if you already have a complete system like this, instead of throwing all this stuff out and going trying to search out hydraulic parts, I would fix what you have here and run it. Uh, they work just fine. Uh, if you don't have anything to begin with and you're just piecing it together, then probably hydraulics are the way to go because there's a lot more components to this system. Trying to find all the cross shafts, all the rods and everything would be a lot more difficult than just, you know, buying brake assemblies, a master cylinder, hoses and lines. If you already have this, I would just stick with it. So again, I hope this answers some questions. If you had any, if I didn't cover anything, there's something you want to know, or if you think I made a mistake on something, absolutely put it in the comments and I'll get back to you on that. Please check out the other videos. There's a few other tech videos up on there and I'm working on a few more as well that'll be up soon. Uh, there's a few videos up on that Roadster and just a bunch of other things going on. So I appreciate you watching. Now get your ass out in the garage and go build something.